What's up, everybody? It's Pastor Tavner. I just want to take a second and say thank you so much for tuning in to Venue Church right here online. Welcome. You are part of the family. And I'm so excited that we're literally getting to build God's kingdom and change the world together. Hey, if you tuned in, just take a second before you move forward with the video and like it, comment, subscribe to our YouTube page, and turn on all your alerts because you don't want to miss everything that God's doing through us, me and you together at Venue Church. A couple more things. I just wanted to remind you that something as easy as sharing this link can really help someone. So if you know somebody going through some things, they need a little bit of God in their life. We say it like this around Venue. Just share the link, and when you do, you share the love. I'm telling you, it can change somebody with one simple click on your phone. And if you'd love to give to the ministry, there's some easy ways that we're going to put on the screen because your finances are helping us make a difference, not just here in Chattanooga, but all over the world. Hey, God's doing something special through this house, and I'm excited for you to hear the word that he's got today. So listen, sit up straight, lean in, get your notepad ready, enjoy the word. I'll see you soon. I love you. Week number nine, I want to jump in. I want to talk to you on this subject. Stuck stops now. Come on. Stuck stops now. If you're tired of being stuck in any area in your life, come on, just give me a big old amen right now. Come on. I hate being stuck. You know what one of the worst things in the world is? Can I be honest? Traffic. Going on a trip. Have you ever been on a trip and you put in the GPS and it says like four hours and then like 30 minutes down the road, it then says five hours. And you're like, what's happening? And you find out about the time you hit Atlanta. And everybody puts their brakes on and you are, say it with me, stuck. I hate being stuck. I am not very pastoral when I'm stuck. I know y'all are more spiritual than me. But I don't just hate being stuck in traffic. I hate being stuck in life. I hate feeling like I'm on a level and I can't get past that level. Have you ever felt this feeling? There's got to be more than this. Have you ever felt that feeling? There's got to be another level. I was thinking about <clears throat> this whole message and I was thinking about me because I wanted to like set it up for you so you could really understand where I'm going. But I'm a shoe guy. I just love shoes because let me tell you the truth. You can have the greatest outfit in the world and ruin it with your shoes. Don't play with me. You got a sick outfit on, and then you put some bobos on with it, and you look awful. Some raggedy shoes that don't even match, and you just walk around, and you, somebody looks at you like, man, oh, good God, and they walk away. Almost had you a date till they looked at your shoes. I like shoes. Matter of fact, when I build an outfit, I build it from the shoes up. My closet is full of shoes, shoes in boxes, shoes. I've given away more shoes than you could imagine. I love shoes so much that I thought, I want to be known as the church when people come and speak and visit. We just leave shoes on their bed at the hotel. We give them shoes. We mail them shoes. For you. Everybody that's a friend of mine knows on their birthday, they're getting a pair of shoes from me. I love shoes. I have my whole life, actually, and my mom knew that, and birthday, Christmas, she would always know, what do you want? I want shoes. So one Christmas, uh, she knew that she shouldn't go buy shoes without me because I'm particular when it comes to shoes. And a couple of times she bought some shoes, and she was excited to give them to me more than I was excited to receive them. Do you know what I'm saying? Because they weren't my style, didn't like them, and, and we had to take them back. She didn't want to go through all that again, so she just took me with her. Pick these shoes out. I I'm going to show my age, and I want to show yours too. Because in this year, what was popular to have for Christmas, whenever, if you could get them, if you could afford them, they just came out. You ready for this? Reebok pumps. Who's in the house with me? Come on. Anybody have a pair of Reebok pumps? If you did, just bend down and go like this. Get ready for the message. Make you listen better. Because that's what they said. If you just pump, one more pump make you run faster. One more pump make you jump higher. Remember that? Shaq had Reebok pumps. Do you remember that? His little commercial. He, he couldn't get the dunk, and then he was like, tss, 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 
fist pumped him up, and then he dunked all on that guy. And that's what you thought, so you had to go get the pumps, and I got the pumps. Did anybody have the pumps with the tennis ball pump on it? Anybody? Oh, you're cooler than I am. I never had those. Still cooler than I am. I like that shirt, by the way. Anyways, um, so my mom took me to get the pumps. And all the way home, I begged my mom to let me have them as an early Christmas present. Did y'all used to beg your mom for early Christmas presents? And she knew better than me because she knew no matter what I said in that moment, if she gave it to me then, I would wake up on Christmas and be disappointed if I didn't have anything to open. So she wouldn't let me have it. So for two and a half weeks, can I tell you what happened? I had to sit around my house and look at those pumps in the box, wrapped in paper, under the tree, calling my name. I mean, literally just had to sit there and know that if I could just get in that box, I would be way cooler than I am right now. If I could just get in that box, people at school would like me more than they like me right now. If I could just get in that box, I could run faster, jump higher, do everything they said. But can I tell you something? I had to wait two and a half weeks. And on Christmas morning, I'm telling you, I was up at the crack of dawn, waking everybody up because I wanted to get into the box and get what was on the inside. Because this is the truth. No matter what they advertised about the pumps, no matter what potential they had to give me, they did no good as long as they were in the box. I'm not preaching about pumps, by the way. I'm preaching about you. I'm preaching about you. Because do you know what I see every single time I walk out on the stage? I see hundreds of presents full of potential, full of amazingness, full of purpose, full of calling, full of miracles. But somehow you got to let it out of the box. Somehow you got to get yourself out of the box. And when you do, everything can change. Listen, say this with me. Say stuck, stops, stops. now. Now. I, I really wanted to talk to you a little bit today about this guy named Peter. I don't know if you met Peter before in the Bible. I don't know if you've been to church, read your Bible much at all. But Peter was one of Jesus' guys, like one of his main guys. You know, he had 180 disciples. Did y'all know that? Most people think he just had 12. He had 180 disciples. And out of them, he had 70 that kind of like were in enough to like go on mission with him. Out of that, he had 12 that just gave up everything and followed him everywhere. And out of that, he had three that would just bury bodies and not tell nobody. And that was Peter, James, and John. Peter, though, was a wild man. Peter, when Jesus found Peter, he was naked cussing people out on his boat fishing. Sounds like my kind of guy. And Jesus snatched him and said, come follow me, and I'll make you fisher of men. And the rest of the next three years, do you know what it was? It was Peter getting himself in trouble because Peter was real messed up. Peter cutting people's ears off with a sword. Peter cussing people. Peter, listen, Peter told Jesus he was wrong and rebuked Jesus. And then Peter, standing 20 feet away from Jesus when he's on trial at a time that he could have stood up and said, get your hands off of him. That's my guy. They were like, do you know him? He was like, nah. Just before he said this to him, he said, I don't care if everybody leaves you, I won't leave you. And 24 hours later, He's like, I don't know that man. Peter, who denied him, didn't stick around with at Jerusalem after he denied him, ran back to his old life and started fishing and cussing and going his old ways again. Peter had a little bit of a dirty destiny. And Jesus comes off the cross and gets out of the grave. And let me tell you how awesome Jesus is. Before he went back to heaven, he walked a seven-day journey across the desert by himself in the hot day, in the cold night, 
wild animals, all the stuff happening, just to get back to Peter to say, I don't care how messed up you are, I still got an assignment for you. Pulled him back off of his boat, spoke purpose over his life, and then gave him the greatest assignment I think ever given to anybody in the Bible. You're going to be the one to start my church. The thing I came to build, the thing that I care about the most, the only thing I'm building, Peter, you're going to be the first guy. And Peter goes from denying Jesus, listen to this, to preaching the first message of the first church of the entire world, the message of Pentecost. Do you remember that day? Have you read about that day? It was a wild day. They start praising and worshiping. The Holy Spirit swoops down. They all start speaking in tongues. Everybody doesn't know what they're saying. They freak out, so they gather around to see what's going on. And Peter stands up in the middle of them and starts preaching Jesus and his church. And in one sermon, you ready for this? 3,000 people got saved in one sermon. How amazing is that? Lord, I just feel like I'm supposed to pray this prayer. I declare right now that there will be a day not far from now that just in this city of Chattanooga, you will build something so great at Venue Church that in one day and one sermon, we will see 3,000 people come to know you in Jesus' name. I believe that. If you agree with me, just clap your hands and praise God in this place. I just felt God on that. I just felt the Lord on that. 3,000 people in one day, guess what happened to them? They got saved. They got baptized. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. Saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people in one day. And then the church exploded. 3,000 people in one day got saved, got baptized, got filled with the Holy Spirit, And then what happened? The Bible says this after that. Ready? That day by day, every single day, the church grew exceedingly. Because special things happen when God's people get baptized. Hold on. Special things happen when God's people get baptized. The problem is, we've grown up in religion. So when I say the special things happen when people get baptized, everybody that's ever been connected to church had a picture of you one day maybe, or somebody you know, or what you just watched, somebody got dunked in water. But what religion does is religion tries to dumb the kingdom down. Religion tries to get you to settle for less than God's best. Religion tries to give you half the information and tell you you're all the way there. When the kingdom has more. Matter of fact, can I just share a verse with you? Can I, can I throw a verse at you? Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Let's go through 3 this time. So so let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. And let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Do you see what he's saying? Let's quit arguing about all the little stuff that we should be way past and really moved on to a big kingdom life. Because we don't need to start again with the little things, the fundamental things, the like repenting and being saved. We don't need to talk about the further instructions about baptisms or the laying on of hands or the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Can you hear what he's saying? Listen to this. The elementary things are raising the dead. The elementary things are laying our hands on people and their life changing. But did you catch what he said? Go back to verse number two. We don't even need to talk about this little thing. The instruction about baptisms. That's what religion, see, religion takes the S off of that word. 
If God's true and everything he says is true and everything he writes in the word is true, then him making that word plural must mean there's more than one. And the truth is, religion has gotten us to settle for one baptism, and we're frustrated because we feel stuck in areas of our life. And the reason we feel stuck is because we do not have yet all the information to get in the right position for God's principles to change everything around us. And that's what I want to do today. I just want to take you through the baptisms. There's three of them, matter of fact. And I want to talk you through those baptisms. I want to explain them to you. I want to help you understand them. And I want to give you an opportunity every single time to respond and to receive them as we go. Because stuck stops now. If stuck stops now, here's the first thing we got to talk about. Number one, we got to become unstuck from separation. What do I mean by that? I mean separation between us and God. That's what the first baptism is. The first baptism is the baptism into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Meaning that there's a moment in your life where you recognize you can't do this life without God. Something told you that, that's the Holy Spirit. Something drew you to that, that's the Holy Spirit. And you awaken and you recognize that nothing you can do can accomplish what God can only do in your life. And you have to surrender to him and receive him. We call it salvation. We call it in church being saved. It's the first baptism is when you recognize, listen, it's not up to me. It's all about him. In order to understand that, I need to maybe take you back to the beginning. I need to let you know God's real purpose for your life in the first place. John 10, 10, the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God has come, why? So you can have life and life to the full. More abundant, overflowing. Listen, God's plan for you is not to get you to heaven. If that was his plan for you, the second you got saved or accepted Christ, why wouldn't you die right then and just go straight to heaven? His plan for you is to get heaven down to earth. God's plan for you is not to reach heaven one day and live on hell while you're here. His plan for you is to bring heaven here while you're here. And to get it on everybody else that is around you. It was his plan from the beginning. It was his plan when he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When he sat Adam and Eve down. Right on the earth. And he said, the culture of heaven is too good to keep to ourselves. There's too much love. There's too much joy. There's too much healing. There's too much peace. There's too much grace. There's too much favor. There's too much blessing. There's too much prosperity. There's too much goodness. I can't leave it all up here. I've got to expand this kingdom. And so he made earth. And he said, somebody's got to rule the motherland. Somebody's got to rule back home. Somebody's got to rule the kingdom. So I got to place somebody else to run my colony for me. I got to put somebody else on earth to run earth like heaven is run. And so he put Adam and Eve on earth. And man, did you know when Adam and Eve first started, they ran earth like God ran heaven. They didn't dig. They didn't plant. They didn't bleed. They didn't cuss. They didn't get mad. They weren't frustrated. They didn't, you know what they did? They spoke and they had power in their words. They walked with God because they had peace that they knew that he wanted fellowship with them. They lived in a perfect state until the little snake came and tricked them. And they ate the fruit. Do y'all know this story? Let me, and then immediately when they ate the fruit, what happened? They lost the ability to think like heaven. As soon as they ate the fruit, they lost the ability to think like heaven. So do you know what? They were walking around naked, didn't even care. 
They were speaking to stuff and it moved. They were walking around talking to God like it was nothing. They owned that place. And what happened? They ate the fruit and immediately they got ashamed of their nakedness and they hid and started trying to cover themselves up. They ate the fruit and when they felt God's presence, they were afraid and thought he'd be mad so they hid from him. Whenever they ate the fruit, they lost the ability to think like heaven and they started thinking like the world. And God didn't want that for them forever, so he expelled them from the garden. And man was alone for years. And because they began to think like the earth, here began man and woman. When I say man, it's not a gender, it's a species. This became man's thought process. I can do it by myself. And it's carried on until this generation. Because this is what most people think, I got this. Matter of fact, you'll hear people say this about religion, it's just a crutch. That's for people who can't do it on their own. So a lot of times when I talk to people and I say, do you have a relationship with Jesus? Most of the time their response is, well, I am a good person. I do good things. And what I needed to tell you today is this, when it comes to receiving Christ, when it comes to your relationship with him, when it comes to this first baptism, you cannot do anything good enough to receive Christ because you didn't do anything bad enough to lose Christ. Listen, you need to hear me. You did not need Jesus the first day you did something bad. You needed Jesus the first day you were born. You didn't need Jesus the first day you were bad. You needed Jesus the first day you were born. Because when you were born and took your first breath, you were born aimed away from your destiny in a broken system called the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says this. Is this okay? Can I go a little bit farther? Are y'all with me? The Bible says this. It says that in Jeremiah, it says that before the foundations of the world, God knew you. Here's what I know. You can't know somebody unless you spend time with them. You can know of somebody, but you can't know somebody without spending time with them. Do you agree with that with me? God did not say before the foundations of the world I knew of you. He said before the foundations of the world I knew you. Which means he had to have spent time with you. Which means before the foundation of the world, in your true form, your spirit form, you were with God. Listen, maybe you don't know this, but you need to understand this. You are not who is sitting in that seat right now. You're not. You all worried about your hair color. You all worried about your weight. You all worried about your height. You all worried about your outfit. You all worried about that. And that ain't even none of you. Come on. All that is is the little house that you have to be in to, or to exist on this earth. That's your flesh. The real you is a spirit. It's a spirit that lives on the inside of this flesh. You are a, a body that is ruled by your mind but filled with your spirit. The thing that is alive in you that has a purpose is a spirit being that was with God before you were ever born and it gave you a name. God named you before he birthed you. He gave me a name. He named me wild, crazy, ridiculous kingdom preacher. That's what he named me. I don't know what he named you. Maybe he named you amazing mom. Maybe he named you phenomenal manager. Maybe he, ma he, he named you entrepreneur that's going to start businesses and fund the kingdom. Maybe he named you amazing, anointed, appointed, set apart singer. Maybe he named you, I don't know what he named you. You know what the thing is that's on the inside of you that God really wants from you. Don't pretend that you don't. You know it. He named you that. And then he picked the perfect place, the perfect time, the perfect family, and the perfect year to birth you into this earth. Here's the problem. The purpose-filled, purpose-named spirit that was with God is now sent and birthed into something broken. The Bible says we're birthed into iniquity. We're born into iniquity. Iniquity does not mean sin. Iniquity means twisted. Iniquity is deeper than sin. Sin is the action that comes out of iniquity. 
Sin is the flower, iniquity is the root that grew the tree that forms the flower. Are you with me? You're born in the, with this root issue of being pointed away from everything God spoke over you. That's why the Bible says that you have to be born again. It doesn't mean you go back into your mother's womb, because if you went back into your mother's womb, you would just be birthed again through something broken. It means that you have to be born again through a relationship with Jesus. Meaning, listen, here's what happens. There has to be a time in your life where you say, I'm done running this twisted life away from my purpose, trying to twist myself on my own. I'm not strong enough to bend back. So what I got to do is I got to close my eyes and I got to focus my thoughts and I've got to be reborn by going back, not to my mother's womb, by going back to God's womb. I got to go back to the place where he originally named me and called me. And now I've got to receive his name again. And now that pulls me back to the way I was aimed to go in the first place and now I can walk out everything I was created to do. That's good, sir. That's good. I'm telling you, you're not that far off. You're just twisted. No, I'm serious. I was a loud mouth before I was a preacher. It was just twisted. I used it for the wrong things. I was witty before I was a Christian. I was smart before I was a preacher. I came up with wild ways to describe stuff that made sense to people before I ever knew this is what I was going to be doing. I was kind of in what I was doing. It was just twisted. Listen, the Bible doesn't say when you were born, your purpose was taken away from you. It says it was just twisted. You're closer than you think you are. All it takes is a rebirth. All it takes is that moment where you say, you know what? I'm tired of spending my life trying to untwist myself. I'm tired of spending my life trying to pull myself back in the right direction. And it seems like the harder I run this way, I feel like success should untwist me, but it never does. You know what ends up with most people? Most people end up dying successful at the thing they were never created to do. Which is why you got people making millions of dollars taking their own life. Because success doesn't bring happiness. Purpose does. And every one of you was called to a purpose. But our twisted life, listen, keeps us separated. Do you understand that? Because religion has taught us that it keeps us separated because God don't want nothing to do with it. Nah. We're separated because our whole life we've been running the wrong direction. So we've created the gap. And God's been begging the whole time, hey, I want the gap to be closed so much I sent my own son, Jesus. I sent Jesus to get beat up for you. I mean, whipped with a cat of nine tails to drag his guts out of his back. Beaten to a pulp where people did not even recognize who he was. Ripped his beard out through a splintery cross that weighed him down, made him carry it more than a mile. Nailed him with huge spikes to a cross, naked in front of everybody, spit in his face, shoved vinegar in his mouth out of the toilet, and then stabbed him with a spear and drug him down and threw him in a cave to bury him and call him dead just for you. And I've said this a hundred times and I feel like I'm supposed to say it again because Jesus did not come to die for you. He came to die as you. Every sin, listen, every sin you could ever name me right now that you have ever done or doing currently or ever will do has already been nailed to the cross. Already. I said that to say, that's how much Jesus loves you. That's how much he's saying to you, I don't want there to be separation. Just turn around and I'll speak over you who you really are. Let me give you the first baptism because you're going to spin your wheels trying to figure this thing out until you receive that. I felt like I've, I've described it this way so many times and I hesitate to because I feel like it's so old that I really felt led to describe it as the, the puzzle that me and the girls were putting together. 
me and my three little girls years ago were putting this little puzzle together and it was supposed to be like a Disney princess puzzle. And you know, you, like if you do a puzzle, I'm not a puzzle guy, by the way. If you do a puzzle, you can like put the little top up and see the picture and then try to make it look like that. And it didn't even have that many pieces, but we got almost done. And th I am not making this up. One piece was missing and it was the face of the princess right in the middle. We never found that piece. I could have done everything in the world that I could have tried. But nothing would have made the puzzle look like the picture. Except the piece that was created originally to go there. Are you with me? What am I talking about? I'm talking about this first baptism. It's our life when we're twisted is we're trying to find our way back right by sticking a bunch of pieces that'll never fit. Right, right. Taking another drink ain't going to change it. Yeah. Adding one more pill, smoking one more thing. I don't know how far, putting a needle in your arm one more time. That relationship, that money, that job, that promotion, that house, that car, all the things. Not that things are bad. Have things. Be blessed. I hope you have everything you wanted. But when the things have you because they're your way to fill that hole, that's the answer that you're the one I'm speaking to right now. That no matter what you've gone through, you've thought of everything you could get and you still wake up in every season feeling the way you felt in the last one. Never fulfilled, never happy, never satisfied. Always wanting more. Super popular actor when I was growing up, Jim Carrey, said it this way. said, I wish every, this is a personal quote. Doesn't even claim to really know God, but this was his quote. I wish everybody in the world could have everything they ever wanted so they could see that it's not what will satisfy them. We got to become unstuck from separation. It's not that broken relationship that's killing you. It's your separation that's killing you. It's not that lost job that's killing you. It's your separation that's killing you. It's not the fact you don't have more money that's killing you. It's your separation that's killing you. And if you can close that gap and say, you know what, God? I can't do it on my own, so here's all I can do. I can just say, I surrender. You do it for me. And if you can do that, every single thing can change. Here's really what I felt like I was supposed to do. I felt like, can we just bow our head and close our eyes? Let's bow our head and close our eyes really quick in the building. I don't know who you are. I don't know if I'm speaking to you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to call you up. I'm not going to bring you in here, bring you up at the front. But I was speaking to some people. I could feel it in this place. I know online I was speaking to some people. If that's you and you would say, Pastor Tavner, listen, nobody's going to know. It's between, it's between us. If you say, Pastor Tavner, you're speaking to me and something needs to change in me. I need to close that gap. I, I got to get untwisted. I got to give my life back to God. I got to surrender and give my life to God. I can't do it on my own anymore. I'm tired. If that's you and you want to make that step, just throw your hand up real quick all over the building. Come on right now. Yeah, I see your hands going up everywhere right now. Thank you. <laughs> Online. Say something down in the chat. Talk to us. We're on there with you. Listen, everybody look up now. Dozens of hands went up in this room. I'm sure hands went up all over the world. People making a decision to say, you know what? I'm ready for this baptism. Right. The Bible says, here's how it happens. It's this simple. If you believe in your heart, the fact that you would respond and raise your hand tells me you believe in your heart. And then if you'll confess with your mouth, if you'll just say, Lord, I need you. 
then you'll be baptized into the body of Christ and you'll be saved. Would y'all do that with me? We do this as a church, so I'm not going to ask you individually. We're going to do it all together. Even if you've prayed it before, pray it loud, pray it proud, so that all the people that raise their hand around you can feel the support of their brothers and sisters around them and saying, we got your back. We're going to pray this with you. Are you ready? Say this. Say, Jesus, I surrender. My life is yours. I can't do it by myself anymore. Come on, say this loud. Say, I need you. Save me, forgive me, change me. I am now saved. I am your child. Amen. Come on, can we just clap and raise the roof in this place? Celebrate people giving their life to Jesus in this room and all over the world. Hmm. Stuck stops now. We're not done with number one. If we're going to get unstuck, we got to get all the way unstuck. We got to get unstuck from separation, but we got to get unstuck from self. We got to get unstuck from this thought that we got what it takes. Jesus said this when he was about to go back to heaven. He said, I'm about to go back. He said, but before I do, I'm going to leave someone with you. I'm going to leave a piece of me with you. I'm going to leave what gave me power to do every miracle I did on the earth. I'm going to leave that part of God with you. This is the Holy Spirit. See, we have, we have mistreated the Holy Spirit in church so bad. We really have. We've actually treated the Holy Spirit like it's a cuss word in church. Matter of fact, when we talk about Jesus, we refer to him as him. When we talk about God, we refer to him as him. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, we just say it. When it's not an it, it's a part of God. It is God the Father... God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is just as much of a part of God as Jesus Christ is. The Holy Spirit is just as much of a part of God as God the Father is. I know it might be hard to understand, but God is three entities in one. The easiest way I can explain it is to explain it to you like an egg. An egg's got the shell, an egg's got the white, and an egg's got the yolk. It's three different parts, but it's still one egg. That's who God is. And we have treated the Holy Spirit so wild. Do you know what we've treated him like? We've treated the Holy Spirit like those towels that hang in our bathroom that have our initials on them. Right? And you went and you paid however much money to get them made and you hang them in there. And if one of your kid touches them, you're like, don't touch that. And they're like, what do you mean? And you're like, that's for looks. It ain't for use. And that's how we've treated the Holy Spirit because we're afraid of the craziness that we think will come when the Holy Spirit gets involved. Because if you've ever heard of church and you've heard of the whole heard of the Holy Spirit, you just think a weird thing's happening. People roll around, people fall out, people speak in tongues, people do all the crazy stuff. The Holy Spirit's weird. No, people are weird. No, I'm serious. And I don't even want to make, put it all on them and make it like they're bad. They've just grown up seeing what they see. You know what I mean? Do you know like if you're a Tennessee fan, Alabama fan, Clemson fan, whatever fan you are, and you've just from birth been raised that way, you don't even know why you're a fan. For years I asked myself, why in the world am I a Clemson fan? Like, we don't win anything, right? Now we do, but we didn't. I know all the songs. I know the alma mater. I know to shake my hand at the end of the alma mater. I know about the, I know all of the stuff because I was just raised in it. So you put me in a Clemson stadium and I can go buck wild with all the stuff because I just was raised in it. So that's what comes out of me. That's mostly what you see when it comes to the Holy Spirit. The expression you see is not because the Holy Spirit's weird. It's because that person is just repeating what they've been raised in. Does that make sense? 
Like saying the Holy Spirit is weird is like saying being naked is weird. Okay. Being naked is not weird. Being naked in the wrong context is weird. Amen. Are you with me? If I'm naked in the shower, that's okay. okay. If I'm naked at Walmart, that's weird. (laughs) If I'm naked at Walmart, we all need help. (laughs) Seriously. If I got clothes on in the shower, that would be weird. The Holy Spirit is not weird. Sometimes people do weird stuff out of context. The Holy Spirit is powerful. The Holy Spirit is your guide. Do you know what a guide means? A guide means someone who's been to the end of the trail and back and knows the best way. The Holy Spirit's been to the end of your destiny and back and knows how to take you step by step the best way that you can go. He's your guide, but he's also your power. He's the power to get you along the way. Everything you need to become every person you need, to become everything you need to be along the way. He's your power. He's your guide. And a lot of us are afraid of him and we've denied him. Because the second baptism is this, is being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Separate from salvation. First baptism, Lord, I'm coming to you, I surrender. The second one is this. It's not that, listen, it's not that you get more of the Holy Spirit. It's that you give the Holy Spirit more of you. Are you with me? It's not that you get more of the Holy Spirit. It's you give the Holy Spirit more of you. Listen, this is you when you get saved, right? I'm going to do it like this because I almost dropped it last time. You get saved and you get filled up with the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of you. Lives on the inside of you. You have the power. Do you know what? I really believe this my whole life. You got the power to raise the dead. Amen. Yep. You've got the power to heal. Right. You got the power to speak to mountains and they move. Right. You got the power, but it's got to be activated and released. Yes. But you know what a lot of times we do? We hold on to self and we think, all right, I know I got God, but I'm just, I'm just going to kind of keep him contained. Because it's safe to keep him contained. Hmm. I was thinking about my dad uh, this week coming up. is one year ago, this week coming up, my dad died unexpectedly. And one of the things we laugh about him around here is you don't ever let B.J. Smith fill up a baptismal. Okay. <laughs> Because he had this uncanny ability that right when he put the hose in the tank, he would take a phone call. <laughs> I'm telling you, I spent thousands of dollars cleaning up church buildings where my dad flooded them. Because he would stick that hose in the baptismal tank and go take a phone call for an hour and 45 minutes. And then I would get a call. And Hello? Man, you ain't going to believe this. <laughs> what? I did it again. <laughs> What'd you do again? Because there's a lot of things he could have done again. What'd you do again? I flooded the baptismal. (laughs) Why am I saying that? Like, what we laugh about was a good thing. Like, it's something we need to learn. It's it's being baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's, It's letting the hose fill us up and stop trying to contain it. And just letting it flood and do its work. It's not keeping it right here and saying, oh, I'm afraid of the mess it'll make. It's saying this, God, I know that I got you. But right now I want you to know that I ain't worried about the flood anymore. Now you have all of me. And I'm going to become submerged and I'm going to become baptized in you. And now there are no more boundaries to hold you. Now you can just go anywhere you want to go. And make any mess you want to make. Because every mess made by the Holy Spirit turns into a miracle. And to be baptized by the Holy Spirit is super simple. There's a lot of things. We'll get into those at another time. But to simply be baptized and receive this power from the Holy Spirit. Now listen, I want you to hear me. 
I grew up in a Baptist church and I went to a Baptist Bible college. And one of the books they gave us was written about all the people that helped build their denomination. And in that book, every one of them said, this is why I got baptized by the Holy Spirit. Every one of them said, separate from salvation, there was a time I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that's when the call in my life took off. Listen to me. I need you to hear this. I think you can do a million good things in your life with the first baptism. But I think without this next baptism, you can't do everything God called you to do. I think you'll live a good life. I don't think you'll live a full life. Because this is the power that's going to release everything. Here's how easy it is. It's as easy as that salvation prayer. By faith, you just say, Holy Spirit, I receive you. Baptize me with your fullness and power. If you want to pray that with me, here's what I want you to do. Just throw your hand up in the air right now. Come on. Yeah, hands going up. Wow, everywhere. Jesus. Can we do this? If you raise your hand, stand up on your feet with me. Come on. We're going to pray it loud and we're going to pray it proud. I love this. Wow. Man. I want you to pray. Everybody sitting down, you either thinking about it or you already got it. I want you to pray it out loud with them. Okay? I'm tricking you because if you're even thinking about it, you're going to pray it and you're going to get it. <laughs> yeah. All right. You ready? out loud, by faith, just like salvation, no different, no matter what you feel, it's real. You ready? Say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit baptize me. Baptize I receive you in your, fullness. in your fullness. You have all of me. You have all of me. Release all potential. Release all potential. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we praise Jesus in this place? <laughs> Look, you may not feel a goosebump. You may not feel warm and fuzzy. You may not feel nothing right now. Most feelings in church have to do with personality, not with what God's doing. It's okay. Faith is not a feeling. Something special is beginning to take place in your life. You just wait and see the things that are about to happen. The first baptism, you get unstuck from separation. The second baptism, you get unstuck from self because the Holy Spirit, the Bible says this, your flesh and your spirit war at each other and you just gave the Holy Spirit the power Amen. to win that war. Amen. That's what just happened. <clears throat> and then we come to the third baptism and we're almost done. The third baptism is where we get unstuck from strongholds. That's the baptism in water by another disciple or another follower of Jesus. Some people have said it this way, when you saw them get baptized, hey, baptism is when we show outwardly to people what God's done for us inwardly. And that's great, that's true. But let me tell you what baptism really is. Baptism is the New Testament form of Old Testament circumcision. So in the Old Testament, whenever people would come into relationship with God and make a covenant with him, I partner to serve with you. They would circumcise themselves. They would cut off a piece of their flesh to represent this flesh is not what holds me. I am now surrendered to your spirit and your move to lead me. That's what baptism is. Baptism is when you say, God... I'm letting go of all control, and I'm letting you drown all the flesh out of my life. And I'm coming back up knowing that every stronghold that was connected to me was left in the water. Listen, don't miss this. A stronghold, that we all sin, okay? I probably sin worse than anybody in this building. Don't laugh. That's the truth. We all sin. We're never going to stop sinning because we are human beings. Right, 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 right. But sometimes things go bigger and stronger than sin. They're a stronghold. It's that thing that we don't even want to do it, but we can't stop. stop. Come on. It's that thing that's got a hold of us that every time we're in the middle of it, we're like, did I do that again? For years, we try to break it. It's not something that you struggle and feel that way about, but you get over it or you overcome it. It's that thing that in every season of your life, no matter the age, no matter what you're going through, it always shows up. Amen. Amen. That's a stronghold. 
It's called a stronghold because it has a strong hold on that part of your brain. What the circumcision of baptism does is when you go down in the water in faith, what God is saying is that I'm going to give you the power that you didn't have to cut that stronghold off of your life. I'm now going to cut it off for you. And I'm going to give you the ability to leave it in the water. It doesn't mean it won't rear its head, but it does mean you now have the power to not let it attach ever again. What I've noticed about people that are saved, even filled with the Holy Spirit, but not water baptized, is they're super spiritual with their mouth and they're super worldly with their actions. And I don't mean worldly like they drink and do all that stuff. I mean that usually they're just downright mean. I remember Avery got saved and baptized at a young age and she seemed so sweet. And when Emery got saved, I thought she was going to be the same as Avery and she didn't. She was not. I mean, a year after she was saved, I thought, Jesus, did you really save this girl? <laughs> and I really felt like in my prayer time, the Lord reminded me, Avery got saved and baptized really quickly. Emery has not been baptized. Yeah. I felt like the Lord said, baptize Emery and watch what happens. Yeah. We baptized Emery. Yeah. And do you know what? Almost immediately I saw changes happen that I didn't see over that whole year before. Because something happens when you take that spiritual step of water baptism. I've given a response to every other baptism, and today I prepared to give you a chance to respond to this one. Yeah, but pastor, like you didn't tell me you're baptizing people. I don't have any clothes. That's okay. We got clothes for you. We have prepared everything. Listen, every excuse you could make right now to not respond, we have already thought about we got a place for you, listen, a private place, men's and women's separate tents that zip up and inside of them, private tents in those tents for you to get ready. We have shorts, we have underclothes for you, we have women's products, everything that you need. We have hair dryers and, and curling irons and all of the products. We have all of the like combs and brushes and all of that kind of stuff for men and women. Everything you could think of that could give you an excuse to say no, we've already taken care of it for you and placed it for you back there. We've got an awesome venue shirt that says Fully Alive and venue on the back that you're going to get to keep. We've got all the clothes for you to wear to be baptized. We have literally taken care of everything. We even fixed the baptismal thing to have a filter on it now so it doesn't have a bunch of your scum floating around on it when you get baptized in the COVID season. Like it's literally filtered and chemically treated. It's ready for you. Listen to me. Anything you could think of to say, I can't do it today. I would say that we prepared so that you could. Because here's what I know. Most of the time when you step out of here and don't do it and say, I'll do it next time, the enemy will fight you so hard to get you to, to not make that decision. So many people left the 9 a.m. and took this opportunity. I want you to do the same. If you're in here right now and you've never been water baptized, or if you have, but it was before you received Jesus, and today you received Jesus, and you want to get baptized for real, for real now. It's time. I want you to be bold. Here's all that has to happen. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to pray that your boldness will rise up in you. And when I say amen, if just one person will get up and walk, you can't wait. I mean, wait and see how many people will follow. Listen, it's so easy. All you're going to do is go out which door? Because I said that door last time, and then they all started going out that door. They're going out that door. This door to my left. And then you're going to see a bunch of amazing people, beautiful people with venue church shirts on, holding signs, pointing you in the right direction. They're going to take care of everything. They'll take pictures for you, and we'll send them to you. We'll post them on the Internet, on social media. We'll take care of your kids. Your kids don't want to leave anyways because by this point they're going to stick them in the room where the climbing wall is and all the candy and all of that kind of stuff and they're like please go get baptized mom even if you've been baptized before just let me stay here I'm telling you I want you to make this step and be bold so Jesus I'm believing right now so many people are going to take this step it's going to blow our mind I thank you God it's not just about did they walk out and get baptized it's about all the stuff that they're going to leave in the water that they're going to step out and begin taking 
huge strides into their purpose because strongholds are gonna be washed off in a way they've never, never even imagined. I thank you, God, that people have been saved. I thank that people have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I thank you we're about to see people get baptized in you. And I thank you right now that this is just the beginning of what you're doing at this church. Filling auditoriums, pulling out chairs, adding services, buying buildings, expanding all over the world. You're going to blow our minds. So right now, these are the people you've called to do that through. So they need to be unstuck. And I thank you that stuck stops now. In Jesus' name, boldness comes on them. They're going to move and never be the same. I thank you right now. Everybody said amen. Amen. If that's you right now, hop up on your feet. If somebody will go, everybody else will follow. Come on. Jump up on your feet and just start going. Come on. Right now. All over this room. All over this room. Come on. Whether you thought about it or not, prepared for it or not, if you're thinking about it right now, I can see that look on some faces. Come on. Just jump up and be bold and take that step and go do it. What do you got to lose? Come on. Just do it. Here's what I want everybody else to do. I want you to go out there and I want you to cheer them on. Because this is a big deal for people. If you've ever been baptized before, it's a huge step. I also know that there's some people in here that you really want to go. And you wish you would have responded, but maybe you've just been a little shy, like getting up in front of people. I want you to know that when everybody gets up to leave, you can still go in that point in the crowd when nobody saw you and you can still go and get get everything you need and get baptized okay we're here for you we can't wait to celebrate you and we can't wait to see you move on from all these places you've been stuck in because stuck stops now thank you so much for joining us today at venue church online we are so encouraged to know that god is using this ministry to touch lives all over the world we don't want you to just stop at our youtube channel though you can join in every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have an amazing team that will be there to engage, encourage, and interact with you. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single life-changing message. If God has used Venue Church to change your life, we'd love to hear how. Send your story to stories at venuechurch.com. If this message changed your life, don't forget to share the link and share the love so that people in your life can experience life change as well. God has something to say and we can't wait for them to hear it. We love you and thank you again for watching.